personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech. Defended by force of arms, if necessary, welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans, both physically and philosophically, helps them fulfill our Founding Fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hi, folks. It's Molly here at Ammo.com's Resistance Library, where we strive to arm you physically and philosophically. And I've got my co-host, Sam Jacobs, here with me. Uh, Today, we're going to talk to you about a man dear to my own heart, Elmer Keith. Um, I'm sure most of our listeners already know who Keith is, but for those who may not, he's basically the father of the Magnum ammunition rounds, um, the 357, the 41 mag, and the ever popular 44 mag. Um, So if you like your big bore revolvers, you've got Keith to thank for them. So Sam, why don't you get us started and tell us a little bit about Elmer Keith, the man. If you, even if you don't like guns, you've never shot one in your life, and you don't care at all about them, Elmer Keith is a fascinating figure. Um, you know, I, I suspect that there's actually going to be a lot of people here who haven't heard of Elmer Keith before now, because I think he's more the type of guy that like your father or your grandfather would be familiar with. And I hope that we are doing our part in keeping the memory of Elmer Keith alive because he is something else. So Elmer Keith is from the kind of tail end of uh, Missouri as the edge of the frontier. He was born and raised in hard Missouri. And he, as a result of this had the opportunity to meet lots of gunfighters and civil war veterans. Um, he claims, you know, as many of the claims of Keith are, whether they're true or not, who knows, we will take him at his word, but his claim is that the town barber who was a former gunfighter, uh, taught him how to shoot using linoleum silhouettes in the back of the shop. So he, he kind of claims this cool lineage from, uh, the gunfighters of the old West. And that, I think, I think that that story is such a good summary of him in general as a person, because it's like this kind of unbelievable story, um, that, you know, places him as a recipient of this kind of knowledge of the the gunfighters of old and almost makes him, you know, the last frontiersman. He's like the last, the last man of the, of the gunfighters of the old West is Elmer Keith. So yeah, definitely like a man of a different generation. He was very much a man. I mean, this guy is like, you know, you wish you were this guy, except for what I'm about (laughs) to tell you about him, which is that in 1911, he was involved in a very bad hotel fire uh, in Missoula, Montana, and he had scars for the rest of his life. Um, uh, It's kind of amazing that he wasn't killed in the fire, but he wasn't. He was in really bad shape. Uh, His chin was fused to his right shoulder. His left hand was turned completely upside down. Um, his father con- contacted a bunch of surgeons in the area and nobody wanted to, nobody would do anything about it because um, the bunch of them said that he wouldn't live to see 21 and that they weren't gonna you know prolong his suffering or bring more suffering into his life by having him do these you know useless um, s- surgeries. So in any event, he and, and he's just a kid, right? He, he's like he 11, was, 12 years old. He was young. Um, let me find his exact, exactly how old he was in 1911. Um, in 1911, yeah, he would have been 11, 12 years old. Yeah. So this, he's a kid. Um, and he's in really rough shape. So, but he's like, he, he hates it. And he's so upset about it that he, he basically demands that his father fix it. Because he's like, I don't, you know, I want to be able to live a normal life, be able to shoot guns and stuff. So Elmer Keith's father is the one who breaks his hand and fixes it. Um, They went down to, this is like, I mean, God, 
you guys aren't going to believe the stuff I'm going to tell you about Elmer <laughs> Keith. Um, dad goes down to the liquor store and gets a bottle of a hundred proof old granddad, which I, I do not drink, but when I did old granddad was a favorite of mine. Yeah, um, yeah. and you know, he, that's what they use for anesthetic. Uh, his father says, break it and set it no matter how many times I pass out, no matter how many times I scream. And his father does it. His father just breaks his hand and resets it. So then they get him a special glove to kind of, I guess, hold it in place. Like, I don't know. This is, <laughs> it's such a strange, strange story. But anyway, uh, spends two years with this glove on and he gets uh, no- normal use of his hand back. I mean, he was a good shooter by all accounts. Uh, he had the hand was deformed, but he could he could rope steer with it and shoot his pistols. And you know, I don't know if normal life is really the term that you would apply to the life of Elmer Keith, uh, but he led a capable life anyway. And he became one of the f- most famous gun writers of all time. I mean, this is, guy was the, the uh, I I don't know. He's like the Hunter S. Thompson of. Yeah. Of gun writers in yeah the, in yeah the he totally is <laughs> century. yeah i mean that's why i say like your father or your grandfather yeah. if you come from a gun family they would have known who this guy was because he was getting between 300 and 500 letters every month um which, and which is nuts we're talking like the 1930s 1950s you know um i found it really interesting i've read uh i know about keith because i write about ammo um but I've like never read his books or anything, but I've seen his picture time and time again. I could pick his picture out of a lineup, but I never realized that he was so scarred until I read your article. Um, and then I kind of was like, he's not that scarred up and kind of went back and looked. And then with, with new eyes, you know, we're talking old grainy pictures, but anyway, I found that completely interesting. And I think it does a lot to say what type of guy Keith was, you know? Right. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it. <laughs> You know, the, there's a pretty low percentage of this story that has to be actually true for it to be impressive. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, that's, I think that, but I think that's kind of one of the coolest things about him is that he is mythic, you know, and we don't really get mythic figures anymore. And that is another way in which he kind of continues the spirit of the old West is that everything about him sounds like a tall tale. Um, yes. You know, and 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 they're all and they're all great. Uh, so yeah, he gets like three hundred to five hundred letters a month. He used to re- he would respond to all of them, and you and he didn't have a secretary. He did all his own correspondence. Uh, people collect these letters. You know, Elmer Keith letters are are prized possessions of many people, either because they're you know they received them themselves or they got them from grandpa or they bought them on eBay or whatever the deal is. People collect these, these, these letters. Um, and he wrote constantly. I mean, you, you, I don't know that you could get a full bibliography. Somebody's got to have a full bibliography of every, every article and everything he ever wrote, but there's a ton of it. Um, and it all started with a letter that he published in American rifleman in August 1925 he wrote a final manuscript sometime in the 1980s before he died um he is possibly the king of the wildcatters but he wasn't really this kind of tinker experimental guy that a lot of wildcatters are he just he was a simple man he found something he liked and he would stick with it he was very much a creature of habit but when he the thing that he wanted didn't exist he would make it and that's how he came up with the 44 magnum yeah. And that's what I love about him because he is, he, you know, a lot of them do consider, uh, a lot of people do consider him the king of wildcatting, but yeah, he wasn't that way. He wasn't doing it to play with ammo or to, you know, see how hot he could get rounds. He was just looking for something and it wasn't available. So he set out to make it. Right. I mean, that's that. And I think that's very much in keeping with his character as well. Cause it's like, it's not, it's not some kind of curiosity about ballistics that motivates him it's all very very practical he needs a round that can do something and that's the thing that makes him want to go and do it so um you know he he was using custom loaded 44 special rounds that were kind of his attempt at making 44 magnum rounds 
and but he wanted something better, so he approached Smith and Wesson. They collaborated with Remington, and then this is where we get um, you know the, the the 44 Magnum. So it was Remington was in charge of the developing the ammunition, and Smith and Wesson was in charge of developing the weapon. It's not so much that he's people call him the father of the, the father of the 44 Magnum, and it's not so much that he designed it because. His wildcatting capabilities, as far as I have been able to tell, are sort of limited. Like he's not some he's not some ballistics genius who makes this perfect round. He's more of a he's more of a high level big ideas guy who's just like you know, I'm tired of carrying a rifle around to drop a mountain lion. Give me a handgun yeah. that can do it, yeah. and then hands it off to somebody who can who can put the pieces together um, to do it. But also, like you talked about, like looking at pictures of Elmer, Elmer Keith, like don't even wait till the end of the podcast. Go on Google image search right now and find pictures of Elmer Keith. And he looks exactly like you think he would look. Yeah, you'd think he's out of an old Western. (laughs) He doesn't look like a real person. He looks like he's a John Wayne character in a movie. I mean, that's the thing about doing this. When I when I first sat down to write about him, is like, how do I make Elmer Keith even sound like a real person? Because he just sounds like he's like I say, the mythic. Mythic is the word for what he what he was. Um, and yeah, and I also think it's cool that his whole writing career begins with um, you know writing a letter to American riflemen because he doesn't strike me as the type of guy I I, I would be. I would bet money that he was shocked to find out that he could make any money writing. Right. So I don't know if you know this, uh, Sam, it wasn't in your article, but I did. um, I had written our guides at ammo.com. I I wrote the guide for the 44 mag and for the 357 mag. And there's a funny story about the 44. Um, So the 44 mag uh, is came about a little different than uh, Keith's first Magnum, which was the 357. That was, uh, a push from law enforcement. But so he like he looked for he was looking for something bigger with it came to the 45, right? Like he he wanted to get he wanted to hunt with his handgun. He couldn't like you said, he was kind of the ideas guy. He didn't really create the 44. He just worked with the companies. But Smith and Wesson was who he worked with, right? And it's the model 29 is what they released in the first 44 mag. But that's not actually the first gun that was released uh chambered in that caliber. Hold on, let me find my notes here so I don't get it wrong. Um, so apparently they were testing, they were they had some prototypes and were testing in a scrapyard and left some shells behind from the 44 mag. And one of Ruger's people came in and found these shells and realized what they were doing. Um, so Ruger actually released their uh, 44 mag Blackhawk um, about a month or so before Smith & Wesson released the Model 29. Um, I just find that funny. It reminds me of like little spies on Bugs Bunny or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I was vaguely, I, you know, I, I actually, I was vaguely familiar with that story. I mean, it makes, it brings a whole new, uh, brings a whole new meaning to like the sign that tells you not to collect brass at the range. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, so we're here, we're talking about the 44. Let's, let's talk about it a little bit. Um, and, one of the you can't talk about the forty four Magnum without talking about um, Dirty Harry. So why don't why don't you take us there, Sam? So yeah, I mean, Dirty Harry is I, first of all I love that movie, um, but the, that's the movie that made the forty four Magnum become the uh, widespread popular round that it is today. So you know, try and picture a Colt nineteen eleven in the hand of uh, Clint Eastwood as Harry Callahan. And it's like, it just doesn't have the same impact. Um, su- it's sudden impact. Uh, haha pun. But, you know, it doesn't have, it doesn't have the, the kind of same visual profile as, as, as the model 29 that he carries uh, in the film does. And this thing, this movie just you couldn't get um the model 29 i mean people were paying three times list for this thing after the release of the uh, after the release of the film because people just couldn't keep the, the the shops just couldn't keep the weapon in stock um 
you know, because the film was so popular, it's Clint Eastwood. And again, the weapons, you know, we, we talked a couple weeks ago about the profile of the Luger weapon and how it's instantly recognizable and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of sexy. It's just like, it looks cool. It's well-designed. It's nice to look at. Um, the model 29 has this similar kind of feel to it, you know, even though like most people, if you, Oh, it's the, it's a Luger, it's the German gun, you know, but the model 29, while most people I, I doubt could name it or even tell you made it or what caliber goes in it, you know, they know like that's the dirty, that's the dirty hairy yeah. gun. Yeah. Um, and that, and that film and the kind of thirst by the public for 44 Magnum rounds and the model 29 after it was released, you know, this is the thing that kind of touches off the, the arms race in terms of, stopping power among american weapons buyers yeah. uh, this is the thing that that kind of sparks that you know there's there's just like there's not this giant market for huge massive you know stop an elephant in its tracks out of a handgun rounds um in america before the film dirty harry comes out which i find very fitting because americans love things that are kind of big big and extravagant and you know over the top and maybe too much and overkill and all that kind of stuff so i think it's really really cool and tying it back to elmer keith like the guy is so just kind of over the top for you know his his personality and the figure that he cuts is just kind of as i say mythic and over the top so it's very very fitting that this round that he comes you know, yeah. that he kind of conceptualizes is the thing that touches off Americans just like cannot get enough stopping yeah. power between the 71 and, and, you know, today. Um, it's funny. So I have here in my notes, I say, I kind of feel like that's why Americans love it so much. It fits with the philosophy of bigger, better, harder, faster. <laughs> right. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I mean, uh, it, and, and I think that, you know, why, um, why, Keith, you know, Keith, I think is kind of this avatar of that in, you know, in, in, in post frontier American culture. I mean, we don't have any, you know, wild West to go off to anymore. Uh, there's no wilderness to conquer, but, you know, Keith kind of is encapsulates that expansive and, um, I don't like you know, that kind of like s s striving and conquering um, aspect of American culture, but he just boils it all down into this, into this Magnum 44 round um, that is, you know, if there's, if there's any round that's kind of, you know, the Levi Coca-Cola, Harley Davidson, you know, this thing that, in, in addition to being an extremely popular product is just a very um, clear and succinct encapsulation of, of American culture uh, of what American consumers want. Broadly speaking, you know, if people have a better nominee for that uh, than the 44 Magnum, I would love to hear what it is. Yeah. I, I think you're right here, Sam, because um, before the Magnum cartridges, um, like there was two types of ammo. There was small bullets that could travel fast. And then there were big bullets that traveled slow. Um, and, and Keith brought, brought was the first to be able to bring those two together. I have some poli uh, ballistic data uh, that I pulled up from our site just to give our listeners a comparison. So I take the 44 mag and I'm comparing it to the 45 ACP. Now I, I know that's uh, an, I picked that one because it's a semi-automatic round uh, of, of, almost uh, equal bullet size. So if you take the standard 44 mag, it has a 240 grain uh, bullet. Uh, so I've compared it to an ACP with a 230 grain bullet. Um, they both have the ACP bullet is a little wider than the mag, but they're about the same size. Uh, but yeah, so the difference in the strength, the Magnum velocity reaches 1,350 feet per second. The 45 gets to 835. So we're talking a huge difference there. And when it comes to muzzle energy, the Magnum's punching power is nearly a uh, 1,000 foot-pound force at 971, and the 45 Auto is only at 356. So this was a type of power um, a lot of American gun owners hadn't really seen before. 
Right. And again, like it, tu- you know, it touches off this whole, you know, the it's almost movement. Right. Right. And it's like, it's like, in you know, the, uh, it, and it also kind of comes, comes around at the right time. Cause there's also like emission standards come around at this time. And so people can't, you know, buy a Camaro like they used to be able to. So I think that there's something to be said for the kind of energy that existed in the auto industry up till the advent of, um, emission standards in some sense being kind of transferred over to the world of firearms. I mean, obviously firearms are not, you know, as widespread of a interest or American obsession as the, as the automobile. Um, but it's not kind of coincidental to me that this, this absolute thirst for greater power, uh, you know, to, to the, to the absolute nth degree, I think is the other thing about it too, is it's not like it becomes decoupled from, we need the weapon to do X, Y, and Z and simply becomes, we want more. Right. Right. Um, I want to go back to uh, the model 29 a little bit, Uh, maybe not specifically the model 29, but it's a big old cowboy wheel gun. Right. Um, I I had this interesting fact that when you, so when it was released, uh, it was a six shot cylinder. And the barrel lengths came between four and 10 inches. But when you fully loaded that, if you had the full size weapon and you fully loaded it, it weighed three pounds, Um, which if anybody, I mean, very few of us walk around with a cowboy sling, a cowboy holster anymore. But um, yeah, I couldn't imagine having a three pound gun in my belt. (laughs) There's no way. It's too Uh, bad most of us don't walk around with cowboy holsters anymore because they're so so cool looking. Um, Yeah, I mean, this, the 44. The 44 mag was the most powerful uh, handgun, was the most powerful cartridge for years and years and years. And also, what's interesting to me about the Dirty Harry connection was, you know, it's not like the 44 Magnum round was, came out, you know, a couple months before Dirty Harry or even a few years. It predates the film by 15 years. Yeah, yeah, you know? a long time. So, so the thing is sitting around just kind of waiting for somebody to give it its moment in the sun. And it gets that from the dirty Harry film. I mean, there's a, yeah, there's a 15 year kind of layover between when the weapon is, or when the round is designed and when it, when it touches off this thing that I keep calling the, the arms race, um, you know, for bigger, 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 faster, louder, uh, and so on. Yeah, I find it a little ironic because um, Dirty Harry, he's he's a he's a cop, right? Um, and how, do you not, like, that's, how are you in America? Yeah. If you don't know this. <laughs> um, but that's not. It wasn't like when Keith was designing the the forty four mag, uh, he wasn't thinking like self defense, right? Was it like he was a handgun hunter and he wanted something that he could uh, hunt with? So it, I just. Uh, you know, it, 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 it is what it is, but it's not like the 44 mag is not a common law enforcement round even today. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I so, can't like, you know, I didn't, again, I don't know the numbers that we did the Luger one and found out that 60% of law enforcement around the world are carrying nine millimeters. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, 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 I like have difficulty seeing any police officer who's not in a seventies movie or TV show <laughs> carrying this ostentatious three pound weapon yeah, yeah, on their, sh- on their belt <laughs> with like a <laughs> foot long barrel, yeah. you know, that has over 900 pounds of force every time you shoot it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's the thing yeah. about it is like, I mean, like I've fired, I've fired a 44 mag. And if you've ever fired a 44 mag, you know, <laughs> big, big, Big bang, go boom. I mean, this yeah. thing is a is an absolute cannon in your hand. And I think that it really is, you know, kind of going back to my analogy about the um about the, the muscle car thing. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a yeah. it's a Mustang. It's a, beast. It's a yeah, it's a it's absolute beast of a weapon. Um, which, you know, I mean the people who like it, that's why they that's why they like it, but it takes practice to get yes. used to firing that thing and if you're small you know g- 
Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like shooting them. I've done it once. Uh, I probably won't do it again. Because <laughs> uh, it is. It's, it's, it travels fast. It hits hard. Uh, it's got a huge recoil, big muzzle flash. Um, it's not for novices. I, lo- I love shooting these these things. Yeah. But I have like, I'm not a big guy. Um, you know, I'm like 5'10", but I have like big ha- I have big hands um, and I lift weights a lot. So I'm used to like grinding my hands on stuff. Um, and I love it because it's like, yeah, I can feel it. You know, it's, it's yeah. to me, it's a lot of fun to shoot. But what's crazy about this round is like, and again, this goes back to like, you know, kind of how like, kind of how crazy this guy is, is like, you know, you know what you can use a 44 mag to shoot? <laughs> Deer. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Deer. Boar. You can shoot black bear with the thing. Yeah. Cape buffalo, uh, polar bears. Like, guy, big game hunters have used 44 magnums to stop elephants. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a couple friends that uh, I live in Pennsylvania, so there's not a whole lot of big, big game here, but I have friends that use it as their bear gun when they ha- hunt out west just because. There's not an animal in North America that the 44 can't take down in close range. Um, yeah, it's it's huge. Um, a, a t- quick tip for anybody who would like to shoot the 44 mag, but um, maybe you are a novice, maybe you're uh, a little fearful, maybe you're a little older. Um, if you can the way all the mags are designed, you can take the special that it came from. So in this case, it's 44 special and uh, it'll fit in the gun. So like I, I have my fav- one of my favorite weapons is a 357 Western Marshall and I th- shoot 38 special out of it because it's easier on my wrist. So the same goes for the 44 mag. If you have a 44 mag, you can shoot the special out of it and it will be much, much easier to handle. <sighs> And you can also like, for what it's worth, you can also get, you can also, you know, there are, uh, there are semi-automatic pistols that are chambered for this thing too. Like, I mean, the desert Eagle is another, um, you know, iconic, um, uh, iconic weapon. We talked about how the, the, like the nine and, you know, hip hop, especially in the eighties and the nineties, like is always getting referenced. I mean, I can like off the, t- there's like Wu Tang songs about desert Eagles and stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you don't like, if you're not a wheel gun person, you know the Desert Eagle is out there for you to, uh, to if you you know if you want the experience of shooting this thing, or you've got a lot of elephants running around your neighborhood. Right. Um, I think they even uh, make a couple carbines in uh, in 44 mag, if I'm not mistaken. Which is nuts um, to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's a big bullet. It's like over an inch and a half when it's all put together. Um. Yeah, so I, I guess um, the only other thing I wanted to talk about, and we did actually touch base on, was the 44 mag as a hunting uh, revolver. Uh, like you said, it can take out just about everything. Um, and and that was that was Keith's big thing. That's what he liked to do, if I'm correct, right? Doesn't right. isn't well, there some like he was a six gun? He was a six gun hunter. Um, so that's what it's really is designed for, more than anything else, you know. So. Um, I know that for many people in many parts of the country, um, you know, feral hogs are a real problem. Um, they don't, you know, you're not going to get the kind of uh, magazine capacity you might need, but you will if you, you will get the stopping power you need with a 44 Magnum. <laughs> right on. Um, and did I see some, I didn't write this one down, so I might be wrong, but did I see some quote in your article about Keith like shooting a mule deer, some kind of crazy distance with, with one of these handguns. Yeah. So he, um, he could drop a mule deer at, I guess, 600 yards. That just seems nuts to me. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's incredible. I mean, that's like not the type of thing that we think about people being able to do with a handgun. And maybe you have to be uh, superhuman like Elmer (laughs) Keith to be able to do it, but he was out there. Yeah. Be of mythic proportions right but he was out he was out there doing it so um you know it it, it can be done um he and he just he didn't like he just didn't like small rounds you know he didn't like the 270 winchester he wanted a big big bullet that was going to do a lot of damage and go real fast well and that's definitely what he created um that's all i got today sam you have anything else you want the world to know about elmer keith 
No, but again, like go like he sells. He has tons of books uh, that you should you know. If, if, one of which is certainly going to be up your alley in terms of um, either your interests in shooting or just you know you could read his his memoirs uh, about his life you know as a guy who liked to shoot guns and a guy who wrote a lot about guns. Um, but you know the pictures of this guy are just like unreal i mean you just can't believe he was a real person yeah he looks it's like a caricature right almost you know you think it's somebody dressing up but he's so cool like i don't like i don't think we're ever gonna i don't think we're ever gonna talk about anybody as cool as elmer keith ever again yeah i don't know i don't think i'm thinking even like some of the bios i've written for for our site like nobody is this um the only one that comes close to me is davy crockett right and that's just because again he's like an american legend um yeah, so uh, I'm definitely, uh, you had listed a book, and I saw he wrote a memoir or an autobiography. So both of those books went on my reading list for the year, for sure. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter, Sam Jacobs 45 over at Twitter. Yep. Yes. And are, are you tweeting a lot over there, Sam? Are you I'm a doing, Twitter fan? I'm doing some, you know, like I, I tend to end up writing kind of quick little, like they, they tend to be multi-part things where I'm writing short essays on Twitter. Um but you know, I'll be doing like you know when there when there's something to be live tweeted, I'll I'll, I'll be out there, and I I'm you know kind of go for like when I actually have something to say, then then every stray thought that comes through my brain. But uh, would appreciate the follow. Awesome, awesome, yeah. So everybody, get out there, follow Sam um, at Sam Jacobs forty five. Is that correct? That's correct. Awesome. All right, Sam. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge about Keith and his big boy legacy with me and our listeners today. Um, thank you, dear listeners, for tuning in. Uh, to show our gratitude, we've got a special deal for you on ammunition. You can check that out at ammo.com backslash podcast. And while you're there on our site, be sure to head over to the Resistance, Resistance Library and check out Sam's piece on Elmer Keith. I will throw a link for both of those in the podcast description. So until next time, folks, in the memory of Elmer Keith, go big or go home. <laughs>